Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miras. Today I'm talking to the 21st century American Catholic painter Andrew Dessau about the 20th century American Catholic painter Carl Schmitt. Hey everybody, the subject of today's episode is an American painter who seems like he should be better known than he is. His name was Carl Schmidt. My guest today is Andrew Dessau. He is the creative director at the Carl Schmidt Foundation, and he's going to introduce us to this man who was not only a devout Catholic and an innovative painter, but also wrote quite a bit about art and God and the artist's vocation, including for the weekly publication founded by G.K. Chesterton. Andrew Dessau, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to uh, be talking tonight. So uh, maybe we can start with a little brief description of who Carl Schmidt is and how you became aware of him. Sure. Yeah. To, to start, I guess, with the second part of that question, how I came to know Carl Schmidt, it was actually through a book. Someone handed me this book. I was I was talking to someone about art and philosophy, kind of as usual, and then and maybe try to get me to quiet. They just handed me this book, this guy, Carl Schmidt, which is a coffee table book called Visions of Beauty. And it was a powerful moment. I mean, it was. It's a simple book. It's it's just images of his work, juxtaposed to just quotes from his writings. And at the end, there were a couple essays that he'd written, and it was really impactful. Around the time that I, I encountered this book was when I was just really getting into painting and, and largely teaching myself, and was struggling. And this book presented very original thoughts. And 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 what struck me was this man, this painter, I'd never heard of him, was talking about these concepts that I'd only encountered while painting in a very abstract way. Never really made it to to really be concrete thoughts for the most part. And, and I found he was writing about these these concepts as far as just from technical aspects of paintings to to kind of grander, bigger concepts and, and questions that were kind of materializing my thoughts, but not very developed. But he tackled them and you could tell he was thinking about them and, and, and his work was just beautiful. And I knew I had to find out more about this guy. Like I said, I'd never heard of him. And, and someone told me I was in DC at the time. Someone told me that his son lived in DC. And so I reached out to his son, Carl Schmidt Jr., who was about or almost around 90 at that point. And we got to know each other. It was kind of a funny friendship, but I used to go and meet with him pretty regularly. Just from the first time I talked to him, just to learn about his father. And Carl Jr. would mostly relate kind of just anecdotes about Carl Schmidt, his father as a, as a man, as a painter. And they kind of came from a very, this image was really beautifully painted because, you know, coming from his son, talking about growing up, you know, as a small kid in this setting, you know, visiting, you know, walking over to his dad's studio and talking to him about philosophy. So it was really kind of an interesting encounter with Carl Schmidt through through that lens. And and I guess to get into the part, like, who is Carl Schmidt? So I, I got to know through his son a little more of the story. So Carl Schmidt, he was born in 1889 in Warren, Ohio. And he, from a young age, people saw his talent and he was sponsored and he, he, he studied in New York City. He studied first at the Chase School with William Merritt Chase and Ron, Robert Henry was there as well. But he, he soon transferred to a study with Emil Carlson at the National Academy of Design. And that was kind of particular of interest to me when I found out I was a big fan of Carlson's still life work. And he was at the National Academy of Design. I think he won he won awards every single year he was there. He was Carlson's best student. And when he was graduating, Carlson approached him and asked, do you want to come study with me privately? I, I, I really think you have a lot of promise. And Schmidt kind of knew he had to be his own artist and he told him no. He said, I, I know I want to pursue this in my own way. And he moved soon after to Connecticut and kind of painted. He had some early successes. He got married and for the most part lived in Connecticut, but some, they spent some time in Europe when, when Carl Schmidt was sick. But for the most part, they, they he kind of painted somewhat quietly in, in Connecticut and, and showed quite widely during his time. I mean, he showed at the Corcoran, the Art Institute of Chicago, some places like that, but really it wasn't for his style and his his approach to painting, it wasn't exactly the best time to be painting. I mean, you start to see kind of the modern understanding of art starting to gain steam in his lifetime. And, and he really was kept above water by a few patrons that really enjoyed his work, I think by good friends. And he, he had a, quite an interesting group of friends 
everything from kind of local painters to artists, poets. He's good friends with Hilaire Bellick, used to come and stay with the Schmitz, which is quite a fascinating story in itself. That's kind of a, a quick glimpse into a, a fascinating character. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what is the distinct approach Carl Schmidt had as a painter? What is it that strikes you about his work as being unique? Yeah, I mean, his work studying at the National Academy of Design when he was there, it's very, you, you look at his early student work, it's very kind of representational, very realistic, a lot of figure studies and early still lifes that just look very kind of classically rendered in some ways. But what's stunning is once you look at especially his, his work later on, he's just this wide array of what some people would perceive as different styles and almost like it's like a couple different painters work. So he's very experimental in his approach to painting. And his approach to painting was, was fascinating because it was in a large part, I mean, primarily influenced by his faith. He understood that he was, you know, painting and he was a Catholic. And he he said, I will never, he never was Catholic in order to be a good painter, although he understood that that was a, there's a connection there, and he said it was always a struggle to it. He was a good painter and to be in order to be a good Catholic. I think as creatives and as artists, that's actually it, it sounds like a small distinction, but it's a, it's a big concept. And so his his faith really informed the way he painted, and and down to even just the processes and his color theory, which is quite fascinating. Tell us a little bit about the color theory. Another reason I was so fascinated by Carl Schmidt, and, and still I, I I stare at his paintings and I, I can't quite it's. It's pretty remarkable the way he painted. He'd actually paint one color at a time. So he would paint, you know, let's say he started a painting in blue. He started painting in blue, and then he would layer on another color. Sometimes he would mix the paint with beeswax, and then he would, after each layer, he would scratch back to reveal the layer before it. And and the way I'm describing it sounds kind of wild, but you look at his paintings and he really achieves this incredible, one thing he was trying to accomplish with his paintings and with all his art was the idea of substance, how do you portray the, the substance of the thing. And you look at, especially his still life work, you really see just, this, you're looking at a bowl. You can feel the smoothness, you can feel almost the temperature of the thing. It's just really kind of bizarre, this process. I've, I've studied quite a bit of painting. I've never seen anything quite like that. So it was really fascinating seeing that that understanding. Yeah, this concept of taking off layers, it makes him sound like a sculptor. Yeah, he he took he spent some time in Italy and, and Michelangelo was a, a big influence on him. And he writes about the artist as being a critic. And he said this is very, you know, as Catholics also you have to be a critic. And and what does a critic mean? He said it's someone who kind of self analyzes and gets to the form or the substance of the thing by taking off which is kind of a beautiful reflection of, of kind of something that that's there, that's underneath, but that it through kind of a process of purification in some ways, it's, it's this taking off of, of this thing. And, and by being critical, which he'd say is just being objective, which is very hard to do, you get to the forms of things. So one thing I've noticed about artists who are Catholic is that they tend to have a clearer understanding of the nature of creativity, of what it is and what it isn't in human beings. So I'm sort of curious about what his perspective on that would be. Yeah, he he had a really beautiful reflection on the creative process. It's actually one of the first essays that I read by him was an essay called Ritual the Gate. And it was written when he's quite young, I think it was 1925, and it's a reflection on you know, how does a painting come to be? And he he, he starts this essay, I, I, I can't quite directly quote it, but it's something like, have you ever noticed how good writing always starts with a ritual and a rhythm? And he talks about how art starts with ritual, which is just kind of just the showing up every day and just doing the things over and over again. I mean, he's not even like chant and in incantation, like it brings you into this place where you're open to the spirit. But his reflection was never that you are earning inspiration or you're, you know, transactionally getting inspiration by going through the spirit and he brings it back even to the liturgy. Like it's just about going through the motions. One could say even say saying the rosary. This repetition, there's something about this repetition, about this action, about this this work that brings you into a place where you're receptive to inspiration. But the inspiration is always a gift. It's never earned. So we saw as an artist, he had a very different view than some of kind of his contemporaries or the the people in the art world of the time who, who saw the artist as this kind of grand mythical being with with grand thoughts that just conceptualize these amazing things. He saw the artist, he, he likened the artist to a peasant. He said, you just show up and you till your soil 
And, you know, there might be some that day, there might not be, but it's your job is to just pursue reality in a very humble and just almost servile way. How did he conceptualize the visual arts as a representative painter? And I, I gather that his work was, was it always representative or did he ever do any non-representative works? It was, yeah, largely representative. I got to symbolic and kind of religious work, but always grounded in things you can recognize. So I'm curious what how his thought balanced the aspect of when you're making a painting, making a new thing that is added to the world and also representing things that already exist. How did he see those two as going together? Yeah, it was a big struggle. I've had the chance to read through his his personal notebooks lately that he kept in his studio. And he always saw this relationship between representing things kind of visually or descriptively and this other kind of more mystical understanding of things. And he he writes about, he, he thought when he was painting, and he was writing this in the 1920s, he said, you know, the last 400 years, we've been very much focused on just descriptive painting. And you can definitely see that. You see this just understanding. And, and I think at the height of the, especially in the late 1900s, this beautiful work and that's very descriptive. The Impressionist ideal is just this accurate, beautiful visual representation of the thing. But he also, I think, and this was definitely informed by his faith and his time in Italy, spending time in Europe, he looked at work from the 1400s and he said, there's also, there's something else here. They're not just, it's not like there's just this lack of ability to describe things accurately. There's also this symbolic understanding, which he understood the the symbolic being kind of the, there's this soul of the painting that is not just the symbolic aspect, but also just the design aspect. He said, a lot of people can draw but not a lot of people can design. And design is understanding the abstract relationship of things in painting that communicates something. So you said that is the soul of a painting. I think if you look at kind of uh, a Raphael painting or, or any really any of the Italian paintings from that time, you get this wonderful, they called it disegno that was running through it, which maybe you might, might not get in, in later Dutch painting or something like that, where it's a little more strictly representational. So we always understood that you're you're using the descriptive, uh, you're not using it, you're, you're immersing yourself in, in the visual reality, but you're also trying to get at the symbolic reality that's there, but you're not making it up. You're just appreciating what's already there and that that reality is most easily understood in the context or informed by religion. So we saw his religion as giving him kind of this, this lens, which he could see beyond just the, the visual appearance of things to really the symbolic nature of, of, of all of reality, really. Could you give an example of how that would manifest itself in one of his paintings? Yeah, he often would paint, even in the most kind of normal or some people would say mundane scenes, he would paint his his family or his children and his, his wife reading. But you understand that it's not just about this scene of this, you know, woman from this certain time period reading this book in this certain setting. There was just this understanding of her in relationship to the scene in his writings he said it's very hard to describe these things that's why we paint them so it's it's hard to kind of talk about them but you get this certain kind of strong feeling and especially from those paintings you have this strong feeling of family of of this home that these people had in the sense of place and that's that's in kind of a a more representational work and some of his later works very symbolic where he's painting a, a madonna and child and it's set in a very different scene and in different aspects of the painting. There's one painting called The Eclipse. And there's some very parts of the painting that just look beautiful abstractly, like almost looks like an abstract painting. But they're also bare kind of a symbolic representation. As for example, he has the eclipse of the moon there and he has a a tear on one side of the painting. He painted this tear and it's supposed to be the the tear of the curtain after the passion and relating that to the Annunciation. Um, it's kind of one example. Did he have any thoughts on the aspect of collaboration with God as a creator? Yeah. He understood his role as an artist in a very, like I mentioned, in a kind of servile way, in a very intense, kind of almost mystic way. He, reading one of the most uh, beautiful writings of his is a prayer that he used to say. And it was just kind of from his personal notebooks. And the prayer is just getting at, he understands that every aspect of what he does every single day brings something to his creative process. He understood the creative process is likened to the creative process of the creative process of the creator. And so he saw every kind of decision he made as 
bringing something to the table when he is kind of following his vocation as artist and creating artwork. And so that meant is he wanted to be servile. He wanted to offer himself to God in order to kind of be part of that creation. So he wanted to renew himself every day. And, and one way he he did that was through, I mean, he had a very tough life, a lot of suffering, a lot of sickness. And he understood that that was part of his vocation, which is just a really fascinating facet of who he was. One of the things that drew me to Carl Schmidt was his understanding of the vocation of the artist. And he had this kind of radically original, or, or if not original, just radical thought. He, he defined the three artistic virtues, and he defined them as poverty, humility, and purity. And, I, and I've studied a lot of painters, and that's not the typical kind of goal of painters is not poverty, humility, and purity. But he really understood to be the best artist possible in even a secular sense, you have to have those three virtues. And so he understood, you know, poverty wasn't just something he, he put up with, but he actually thought of as a vocation. And, and humility he saw as something that informed the way he saw things, because he understood to see the reality of things, to see the objective truth behind things. It takes a humility to kind of like to stamp on oneself kind of subjective understanding of things. So he thought to practice humility and have humility helps you see things objectively and purity as well. I mean, you're never aiming to use the things in front of you or use the objects or use the people, the things you're painting. It's always about this understanding of these objects as beautiful in themselves and sacred. And he thought that if you lived a life of purity, it's going to be much easier for you to see things in, in that manner and, and to kind of put yourself in the right order with things. So I think with that's something that I've I think it's kind of informed my, you know, goals moving forward. And I think that's something we really is a foundation to want to put out there, helping young artists to understand a lot of the, the stuff that's put out there when people are trying to pursue arts or looking for resources, you're not going to find information like that about the specific vocation of the artist. And I think Catholic or not, that's a really vital understanding. And that answers actually a lot of people's questions that, you know, getting into the arts isn't about you know, getting rich and getting fat, you know, it's, it's, there's something sacred about it and that it really is a vocation and it's not a practical one <laughs> at all, but that it's right context really is, is informed by religion. It's informed by your virtues. Um, and, and we're passionate about through, you know, our residency program, through our events, kind of communicating that to the public is like, what is the understanding of, 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 artistic vocation. When an, a young artist, you know, let's say that you're finishing school and you get all this this wealth of information is, is on how to pursue your art. What do you what do you convey? How do you do it? How do you live your life? And and I think Carl Schmidt offers this really fascinating example of how to do that. I've I've read quite a bit, you know, in the last there's been so many books published on aesthetics in the past century and kind of a hot topic and and amazing reflections even from the church or letters to artists on beauty and these grand ideals and the dialogue with the church and the important aspect of beauty as as redeeming and uplifting and transcendent. And it's just amazing to read those things. And I think a lot of young Catholic artists are reading those, but at the end, you're kind of, uh, I find myself just how, how do, how do we pursue these big ideals? And, and for me, Carl Schmidt was this really interesting example of someone who actually aimed to live these big ideals in his quiet way in Connecticut. And he's very as such, he's actually he's quite relatable. He's an American. He lived in the past century. And there's a lot we can learn from his the story of his life and his work. So that's been kind of a fascinating thing to get into and, and try to share with people as well. So yeah, let's let's talk about his life and maybe how he pursued his artistic vocation throughout that. I don't know where you think the best place to start would be. Yeah, I think one place to start is soon after he finished studying with Carlson, he moves to Silvermine, Connecticut, where some artists had started gathering. And soon over his lifetime, it came like a, a real place of an artist colony. And he was always, you know, as much as he was just very intense with his painting and an intense figure with these theories and these thoughts, he was always a very affable person. He had a lot of friends who... A lot of them looked up to him and learned from him. Poet Hart Crane actually was kind of a mentee of his. He studied with Carl Schmidt. He studied rhythm with Carl Schmidt. They used to get together for a couple of years. Hart Crane would come over in the evenings. They would both write three poems, but the rule was that they couldn't actually make sense because Carl Schmidt said that Hart Crane had, a, you know, he, he was telling beautiful stories, but he didn't tell them as beautiful. He didn't really have this love for that that abstract nature of the words, and so they used to just write these 
nonsense poems, but just focusing on rhythm and meter and and beautiful aspects, which inform Carl Schmitt's work. And and Hart Crane attributed his understanding of rhythm and meter to Hart, to, to Carl Schmitt. So one facet of his work is this this man who was constantly bringing in people to stay with his family. He had ten kids, which is another you know he many painters with ten children, and he had 10 children and he raised them largely in poverty another kind of remarkable fact and i've i've had the privilege to meet quite a few of his children who are still alive and you'd imagine you know children that their father you know they were raised in poverty you know great depression but also just because he was a painter and he chose to be a painter he could have got a you know another job at any point it's almost by choice and you'd imagine the children be resentful or just you know dismissive but the children have this amazing admiration for their father I and mean, every single one of his children were just pretty remarkable characters followed really interesting career paths and and had beautiful families so i think that also speaks to to this man so with you know 10 kids in poverty and then you know you add to that he for a large part of his life, he was very sick. He had tuberculosis, which forced him to, someone actually sent him to, to a, a sanitarium in Italy. And his family joined him shortly afterwards. And they were actually at one point thinking of settling in Italy permanently. But then Hitler and Mussolini had other plans. So it, it didn't quite work out. They moved back to Silvermine, where he painted, his, his children built him this house and studio which is now the headquarters of the Carl Schmitt Foundation in, in Silvermine. And he painted kind of quietly and honed his thought. He did quite a bit of writing, had a long correspondence with Hilaire Bellick. He, he wrote for Chesterton's weekly newspaper. He didn't have a high school education, but he was writing for this publication and, and others. And, and again, another kind of contradiction, a painter with 10 kids, you know, not formally educated, but was writing for these publications. Uh, just a really fascinating character. How did he get to know uh, people like Belloc and Chesterton? He was a young student. And this was right when I think Belloc was first publishing a lot of his works. And a friend said, "You should. I know you like Chesterton. You should look at this guy, Belloc. And, and Schmidt just wrote to him after he read a book. He was just very impressed by his work and sent him a letter. And, and that started a correspondence between the two. And and it's an interesting correspondence reading some of the letters. One theme that always came back is Belloc was saying he wanted to show him some of his own drawings. And Schmidt was always pushing Belloc to write an epic poem. He said, what are these kind of pop boilers in these essays? I want, you should really, I think you're a, a true artist and you should really pursue that. And they actually, they met in Italy when, when Schmidt was in Italy. And then throughout, Belloc used to come and visit the Schmitz and, and stay with them and kind of an, a bit of an unlikely kind of relationship there. Belloc, I think, really recognized this painter and his his writings and his, his work as being interesting and different. I mean, it was, it was, he was surrounded by artists, but he was really interested in, in, in Schmitz's work as, I think, quite pure in some ways. I'm sort of curious about this, this aspect of working with artists from other art forms. I mean, you mentioned his, his mentorship of Hart Crane. I mean, had he been writing poetry up to that point, or was this just sort of something he pulled out out of the blue? I think he he writes a lot in his work about the idea of this kind of mystical force that informs all the arts. And one word that he comes back to a lot is rhythm. And he, un, he uses rhythm to describe his painting. And even his painting, he describes, he uses words to describe different phases of painting, such as the lyric, the dramatic, and the epic. So he's constantly borrowing from different fine arts and these terms to kind of describe just painting. But I think he understood that rhythm and poetry and painting, back to kind of the disegno of the Italians, this there's there's something kind of very intuitional and, and hard to describe, but that runs through poetry, through painting, through sculpture, through all the fine arts, and definitely dance. Roschmidt's wife was actually a studied dancer as well as pianist. So you, you do get some of that influence. So he understood that this this idea of rhythm, you know, it's a heart crane really was something that Carl Schmidt was struggling with in his paintings. He was trying to have the viewer's eye uh, flow through a painting in a certain manner that's very similar to maybe a musician trying to grab a, a listener's ear to to pull them down a tune. And so I think he he understood them. They're all coming from this same kind of region, this this elsewhere, and that it's just very helpful for artists to collaborate or talk with other mediums kind of gets you out of your own head and, 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 and pulls you towards kind of the bigger picture of the fine arts. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of my friend, Mark Christopher Brandt, who I interviewed for 
Catholic culture last year. It's funny that that interview was an audio interview, but before the podcast, but it ended up being the impetus for the creation of this this show. But you know, he his kids are Irish dancers, and and I remember you know hearing about him helping Irish dancers work on rhythm and things like that. He's a musician, right? So although of course that's more perhaps more understandable than a, a painter teaching a poet <laughs> yeah. about rhythm. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see that. And I think I think the, like the deepest, truest artists can can do that. They can right. transcend their own medium. Yeah. It's interesting going back to one of the, the Schmidt's essay on the creative process. He talks about how most people have to go through the rhythm to get to the inspiration. But he said there's a few very rare characters in history that like you said, they start actually with inspiration. That this like intangible understanding of the mystery of things actually fills them and then they then they, you know, through the means or sometimes they break the rules, but that somehow these people have these incredible gifts to really just start with the vision and then move towards the process, which is really interesting. So as a Catholic, I assume that he would have thought that inspiration comes from God. Yeah. He was he was an incredibly pious individual. He thought that, you know, he was always pursuing beauty and he understood that beauty was God. And that we were living in this crazy universe, and that his vocation as an artist was was that. I mean, being an artist brought him closer to God because it was his vocation, and so as such, it, he was it was very important to him, and and a really a primary. You 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 can't really understand Carl Schmitt without understanding his vocation as an artist and his his zeal towards trying to you know pursue that. I'm kind of curious about his marriage. You talked about him having ten children, and presumably, you know, I, I guess poverty is a re- relative term. But you talked about him living in poverty. I'm assuming, you know, his children were able to eat basically and everything, but they just, you know, were were not what you would call comfortable, perhaps. But obviously, he had this wife. Who was she? You know, how supportive was she of his his vocation? How did that relationship work in, in, in relationship to him as an artist? Yeah, she's about as remarkable as him. She came from, her name's Gertrude Lord. Her father is Austin W. Lord. He's an architect. He helped start an American school in, in Rome, I believe. So she came from a very wealthy family. I mean, they had a summer house in Silvermine, Connecticut. And that's how she met Carl Schmidt. And I was recently at a family member's house. And there's this beautiful, beautiful pastel that that Carl Schmitt did of his wife, although she was not his wife at the time. And it's just a close-up of her face. And then and someone said, you know why she looks so sad? And I said, I don't I don't know why. And they said, because Carl she knew that her parents are about to give Carl Schmidt a scholarship to study in Rome because her parents wanted to keep this crazy artist guy away from their daughters. They they sent him to study in Rome. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's but it didn't work. That's a very clever scheme, actually. I know, it makes I mean, I think it's 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 hard for an artist to deny studying in Rome. I yeah. Think. <laughs> yeah. So then he comes back and and I mean it clever scheme, but it didn't work out in the long run because I end up getting married and like I said, had ten children and there's this uh, this article I, f- I forget exactly what was the publication where this this writer came and st- stayed with their family because they constantly had guests over, and to the title is something like a, a crazy man and his crazy wife, where he describes Carl Schmitt as this kind of madman with these these children running around in various states of dress and this um, like saintly mom taking care of the whole thing. She was just serene and um and. But the writer was writing and he said it was a little taste of heaven. He loved visiting there because there's something about, and I think especially when they're bringing in these artists who never really, a lot of them never had a very good or clear understanding of what a family looks like. And then to be launched into, you know, a lot of family, <laughs> 10 kids, uh, is a really kind of a novel idea and, and just beautiful scene. And, and and also just stories from the children that I've got to know of, you know, them running around in Connecticut and just their, their father's kind of guiding them. and and and. His he saw fatherhood in a very beautiful light. He never, his one of his sons was telling me he never really, he never treated them all the same. Meaning he understood that each one had a, an individual vocation, and he always was about them fostering that. And he also had this beautiful detachment. At one point, I forget exactly the story that led up to it, but the the child I'm asking he's like, "Why are you looking like that?" And he said, "Well." You're not really my kids. You're God's kids. I'm just here to watch. Like he just had this understanding that he was doing all he could for his kids, but at the end of the day, they were, they were called to something bigger. And 
he saw his vocation as an artist not being at all opposed to his vocation as a father. He understood being a father and a husband was a higher vocation to being an artist, but in order to be a good father and a good husband for him meant being a good dedicated artist, which is, again, a rare understanding of those two vacations. Yeah, I mean that's incredibly inspiring. Even some of the great Catholic artists, you know, were somewhat somewhat tormented, yeah. you know, and didn't necessarily have spatial, stable family lives. So it's great. It sounds like a holy man. And to have a wife who is supportive in that. And I think to be in a situation of what you might describe as poverty, but sort of uh peaceful and confident yeah. you know, poverty. Providential. Yeah, exactly. Providential. Is very inspiring, and I think we're we're all looking for that. You know, artists are all, all looking for that that partner, right, <laughs> you know, that yeah. spouse who right. who will be able to go there. Just enough crazy. Um, yeah, exactly. So, did he have uh, formal students? No, he didn't take very many students. At one point, I think he taught some of the the children in the area, and and really the closest to a formal student was his daughter Gertrude. So he had. 10 children, as mentioned, but nine kids, and the last one was a girl, <laughs> which is just kind of... He, nine, he had, nine boys and a girl. Nine boys, sorry. Nine yeah. boys and then a girl. And he 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 always had a, a sense of humor, and he thought that was just kind of hilarious having just the mm, girl wow. at the end. But she actually, none of them really pursued the art. She was the only one that really got into the painting. And I had the, the privilege to get to know her earlier this summer when I moved up to help with the foundation. I was actually helping Gertrude and driving around, taking her to mass. And it was just amazing hearing stories about her father in the area, we would just, you know, be driving through the town and she would tell me, you know, we used to play on this bridge or Hiller, Hiller Bellick's son used to live there or, you know, this poet used to, you know, just all these amazing stories about this town, which has since changed in some ways. And she was a very talented artist. She she studied in Rome as well. She went to the National Academy of Design and, and won uh, a prize that they sent her to Rome for three years, which is pretty sweet. And she, getting to know her was she passed away just a few weeks ago and, and just getting to know her and, and during that time of her life where most people are, are scared or you know she's quite sickly, but always so joyful. And I think that was representative of the way she, she was brought up as well. Just kind of just taking on these challenges and not really thinking much of it and thinking about the next thing. I mean, she was just such a peaceful woman with a hilarious sense of humor Till the end. I mean, she was just telling the story. She was, she just asked, she was at the house. She said, you know, do you want me to hear the hospital? <laughs> we said, you know, you can't say that, but she just was just smiling and radiant and, and had a beautiful body of work that was very similar to her father's. She painted in that same method of painting one color at a time, which is really fascinating. And, and her, her drawings of Europe and, and just, just a wonderful person. Again, another kind of She's like a character from a bygone era, just seeing her in this this setting with that, you know, the house. And but yeah, she was she was really his 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 best student and and you could some ways say his only student. Right. So obviously he had a circle of people, you know, so there was there was influence and mentorship and stuff, but in terms like of a formal student relationship, that was the main right. the main one. Right. How did you get involved with the foundation? Yeah. So I, I like I mentioned, I read that book and I got interested and was just fascinated by this whole project. So fascinated by Carl Schmidt, but then also fascinated by the foundation. The foundation was started by Carl Schmidt Jr. in I think 96. And it was really dedicated to kind of the first thing is preserving his works and his thoughts because they are so original. A lot of his writings is just these fascinating theories that I haven't heard anywhere else. And I, I think anyone who's encountered them, we had a professor of art history coming from NYU and she was looking at his notebooks and she said, you have a hundred theses here. Like this is incredible, and and then not to mention his painting style, as I mentioned, completely original. So it's to lose that would be a real tragedy, and to not preserve the paintings right, but also preserve the property. The um, the foundation was gifted the property by the family, and so we have the home that Carl Schmidt designed and his his teenage sons built, and then we have a studio that they built for him. And then we actually have his original studio that was a down the road and they actually moved over. Beautiful Northlight studio. I've had the privilege to paint there and it's been a wonderful experience. Just a gorgeous light, amazing spot. And so just this fascinating kind of this foundation kind of preserve these things, but also they had this mission to, they really wanted to reach more people and they wanted to bring in someone who can understand the artistic aspect of, of, of the work. And it was kind of remarkable earlier this year, I was finishing up painting, ended up working actually at a startup company and was 
it was a bit wild. I was working 50 to 70 hours during the week and I was trying to do a 14 foot painting commission on the weekends and it was just, it wasn't really sustainable. And, and I, I, my girlfriend at the time being the level headed one, she said, we need a prayer novena. And I said, all right, sounds good. She said, all right, we'll pay one for a job. I know you want to move and a studio. I said, sounds good. And I, we started the novena the ninth day. I'm talking to Carl Schmidt or something is scheduled and we're just talking and, and he said, I have this idea. And he said that the foundation needs, we have this short-term need of someone just taking care of the place because the former people living there and moved out. And we also think this would be the time to launch our kind of long-term plan for the foundation as having this wider reach. And it was, you know, <laughs> I couldn't say no. <laughs> it was just providential in a lot of ways. And so I just jumped on and we, we we started the fall with some programs. We have some exciting stuff coming up and some really big goals for, for next year. So it's been kind of a wild ride and, and still kind of hard to believe in some ways. So what kind of programs are you doing that the public can get involved with? Yeah, we, we have a certain events coming up. This is a uh, first of the foundation, but I'm, I'm kind of leading a DC tour so we're we're bringing some accomplishments works down to DC and they're going to end up at the Arts Club of Washington which is a beautiful historic space down there it's James Monroe's old house it's, it's just beautiful little gallery space and in conjunction with that we're doing two events in DC the first which we're very excited about is on October 27th which is last Saturday in October and it is a symposium and the discussion is defining the role of the catholic artist today and I've just had a blast getting together a panel for that event. We had some, really some of my favorite artists working today, favorite Catholic artists. We're each going to come bringing some of their work, talking about their creative process behind the work, and then helping us kind of discover what is the role of the, the Catholic artist and, and really creating a, a dialogue, hopefully a discussion, maybe some arguments. And it should be a really amazing evening that will take place at Our Lady of Catholic Hope, Our Lady of Catholic Hope, sorry, Our Lady of Hope in Sterling. And we'll also have some of Carl Schmidt's work up. So that's going to be a a fun event and we're actually we're working with the diocese the arlington diocese kind of hopped on in this event and we're, they're co-sponsoring right, it right which is awesome yeah that's wonderful and it's actually going to be live broadcast on the website so go to carlschmidt.org slash live you can register to watch it if you can't make it in person yeah that's a great thing to have down in arlington I mean, that's the diocese i'm from and it could be that they've always had you know artistic events like that but if when i was there i wasn't aware of it if, if there were right. so it's, it's such a great catholic community there right. that i and so many talented people i think that's that stuff should be should be happening there i mean when we were looking around places to have it we said you know it makes sense having arlington diocese they're building churches they're building churches right. with amazing <laughs> yeah, budgets exactly. with great you know architects so yeah, it's you know totally. a great i think i really do think that diocese could be a, a big piece in, in, in a new renaissance i'm so excited to be working with them in some way have you ever been to a holy trinity i haven't down there no that's we're... worth visiting okay it's in like gainesville okay basically. cool like, yeah like it's a, a beautiful church and that's relatively new so people can visit the foundation. They can visit the house, correct? Yeah, they can come visit the studio and the house. The two studios especially are, are, are really wonderful to see. One's been kind of converted into a library and little headquarters of the studio. And you can see you know, the paintings, but also the objects and the notebooks are all there, the letters. And then the other studio is a working studio. So the, the you know, you're setting up and painting there and my big goal with the foundation and, and what I think I have most to offer and what I'm working towards setting up, which is really exciting, is a artist in residence program run out of that property. And we're really excited about trying to implement that in 2019 and, and to, to raise the funds to, to make that possible and get it off the ground. Because I think the impact of that would be just a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your own painting? Yeah. So I, I, I started, I primarily paint in oils. I studied in the Boston School tradition with Pauline Britson, which is kind of a branch of American Impressionism that was derived from French classical painting. So it's very kind of accurate drawing, but with very visual colors. And I found that that base really has given me a really good grammar towards kind of pursuing more of the, the poetry of painting, which I'm trying to explore now as a painter. And, and, and Carl Schmidt obviously has been a, a very large impact just in his subject matter and his, and his approach to kind of the bigger questions of painting, I mean, the substance of the thing. So, so I'm, I'm very much focused on still life at the moment. It's, it's hard not to be when you're surrounded by all these 
I really need objects that Carl Schmidt painted in, in his own still life, and as well as portraiture is something I, I'm very passionate about. So I just been having a, a great time at the studio, kind of pursuing my own body of work while working with the foundation. Great. So is there anywhere people can... Do you have a website people can look at any of your works online? Yeah. If you check out Andrew Desaw Art, so that's Andrew, D-E-S-A, art.com, this little gallery, and you can click through some of my works. And yeah, I'd really appreciate anyone who takes an interest. Great. What about the foundation? Where can people find the Carl Schmidt Foundation online? Yeah, it's just carlschmidt.org. It's Carl S-C- uh, H-M-I-T-T dot org. I always tell people not to be <laughs> mixed up with the Nazi political theorist, but Carl Schmidt dot org, the, the Catholic painter. So if you visit that, you can see a gallery of some of his works, some of his writings, a little bit about the foundation and, and information about visiting the studio, which we're, we're, we're excited to make that all available to, to the public. It's about an hour north of Manhattan. It's right off the MTA North Line. And if you give me a call, I'll even pick you up from the train. So <laughs> love giving tours and, and and having people come out and see the place where this man painted and, and where his family lived. It's, it's, it's really, you get this very strong sense of place, I feel like, when you visit it. When I first visited a few years ago, it was just really, I guess the place is somewhat countercultural. Like it just kind of feels just very stationary like it's just very peaceful and and it's not new york city it's you know trees and you know it's it's a it's a beautiful area which is also helpful when you're painting all right andrew thank you so much for coming on the show it was a blast thank you so much this has been a great time today's reading is a quote from the poet christian wyman i once believed in some notion of a pure ambition which i defined as an ambition for the work rather than for oneself but I'm not sure I believe in that anymore. If a poet's ambition were truly for the work and nothing else, he would write under a pseudonym, which would not only preserve that pure space of making, but free him from the distractions of trying to forge a name for himself in the world. No, all ambition has the reek of disease about it, the relentless smell of the self, except for that terrible, blissful feeling at the heart of creation itself, when all thought of your name is obliterated, and all you want is the poem, to be the means wherein something of reality, perhaps even something of eternity, realizes itself. That is noble ambition. But all that comes after, the need for approval, publication, self-promotion, isn't this what usually goes under the name of ambition? The effort is to make ourselves more real to ourselves, to feel that we have selves, though the deepest moments of creation tell us that in some fundamental way we don't. Souls are what those moments reveal, which are both inside and outside, both us and other. So long as your ambition is to stamp your existence upon existence, your nature on nature, then your ambition is corrupt, and you are pursuing a ghost. All right, thanks everybody for listening as always, and God bless.